Revelation 5. This is uh, one of my favorite things to teach. And I'll tell you how I, how I came on this. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, um, when I wrote my first book, By Divine Order, I sent a copy to Southwest Radio. And I didn't hear anything from them. And it happened that Lisa and I were in Oklahoma City. I don't remember why we were there. But I told her, I said, I want to I go by Southwest Radio's office and see if I can talk to somebody there, see if they got my book. And um, so they... Uh, when, when we got there, I uh, told the receptionist who I was, and I wanted to speak to somebody. And uh, Brother Larry Spargimino, who's still there, by the way, um, he came out. And I kind of walked him through the book. And um, he asked, he looked at it and seemed interested. And I didn't know at the time, but uh, Brother Noah Hutchings had written a book called God the Master Mathematician. And it was on Bible numbers. And so he seemed a little interested in it. He asked me if I uh, followed the ministry of Peter Ruckman. And I said, I don't even know who that is. And I wasn't sure why he asked. But... Uh, just from the things that I found out about this guy named Peter Ruckman, he's not, not my kind of guy. I can tell you that. And um, so anyway, they, I guess they took a look at it, read it, and liked it. And they called me and they agreed to publish it. So I, you can imagine how excited I got. And did some programs with them. They flew us to Oklahoma City and we did... Five radio programs with Noah Hutchings, and um, he right then invited me to do one of their conferences, and uh, we had fun with that. But along the way, I met uh, Dr. Chuck Thurston. He is an ER physician, and ER physicians are about the top-notch doctors in the country because you got to think fast, or you're going to lose you're going to lose a life. And he was one of these, uh, I forgot what city he worked in, but it was a city hospital. So him and he got gang shootings, he got stabbings, he got rapes, he got everything that came in. Car accidents, people falling off buildings. I mean, he got it all. And um, he was a born-again Christian. And every now and then, he could tell the difference between somebody that was psychotic and somebody that was possessed of a devil. And... He used to, he told me, he said, if I knew somebody had a devil in them and they were causing problems, he said, I'd start praying and then tell the devil, put a cork in it or I'll get my master Jesus down here on you. And, uh, but anyway, he wrote a book called Aleph Bet Soup. And Aleph and Bet are the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And I don't think his, his books are kind of like mine. They're interesting, but they didn't sell a lot. So, but I had a copy of it. He gave me a copy of it, and I read it, and I liked it. And it, he was the first one to introduce to me the idea, because he's a medical doctor, and this is the way he thinks, that the human cell that makes up every part of our body is a perfect picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I went... That makes sense. And he explained a little bit of it. And then we met up again in Ohio. We was doing a conference for Southwest Radio. And I told him that not only was he right on that, but then I began to show him the numbers that related to it. Numbers in the Bible and then numbers that relate to the, the human cell, the number of chromosomes we have, and so on. 
And he liked that. He'd never thought of that part of it before. And so from then on, I just began to try to learn everything that I could. And I'm still learning about the, the human cell. So let's read in Revelation 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you very slowly through the components of the human cell and our DNA and how those things match perfectly what's in our Bible. Uh, first thing I want to do is get a, I want to get a picture of a cell here. I guess that will work. Let's see if I can find a better one. I don't know if I have one in here. Let me go back. Right there. Okay, let me make that bigger. All right. That is a picture or a drawing of the cells that make up your body. Your skin, your liver, your lungs, your heart, your muscles, your blood, your blood vessels, your toenails, um, the glands in your body, all the different organs of your body, every one of them are made of these little building blocks called cells. Now, everything in this world that has life is made up of at least one cell. There are one-celled organisms. Okay, we didn't know that until they invented a microscope and they started looking at water and blood and things like that. And they could see little things floating around in there and they seemed to be moving. So they knew they were alive. They didn't know these things existed before. So about the same time, they discovered bacteria. And imagine if you would being a woman and going and seeing a doctor who is going to help you give birth or something like that, and he works with you with unwashed hands, and then he goes right over to another woman and works with her without washing his hands. So in this hospital, I can't remember what it was, don't remember the story, don't remember the name of the doctor. This one doctor, he was a, a, female, a woman's doctor, and... All of his patients at one time ended up dying on him and he couldn't figure out why. All at once they started dying. Well, he was reading in the Bible one day and he saw that just about everything that the priests did in the tabernacle, they washed their hands. They were always washing their hands. There is a, a laver in the middle of the sanctuary, a big brass bowl full of water, and they were always washing their hands, they were washing their feet. God's a clean God, amen? So what this doctor started doing was, before he would touch a patient, he would go and he would wash his hands. And he, after he worked with one female patient, then he'd stop, he'd wash his hands again, and then go to another patient. And he noticed that they stopped dying on him. So he realized there must be something on my hands that I can't see that I'm transmitting from patient to patient to patient. Now that seems so simple now, now that every building in America has some place where you can squirt hand sanitizer on your hand. But back then, nobody had thought about that. Okay? Meta, um, military doctors. Sawing off guys' legs, more patients died from infection than they did from the wounds they got in battle. Until they figured out, you got to wash your hands, you got to sterilize it. So anyway, um, I want to go back to the very beginning. Let's go back. 
500 million years ago on planet Earth. Which is not real. Okay? But let's try to do something in our minds. Let's try to figure out a way that nature, all by itself, can accidentally create the very first living cell. Okay? Let's try to, let's try to think of how that can be done. Now, I'm going to point out to you uh, some of the various parts of the cell. Um, right here is the cell nucleus. That's the core of the cell. That's, that would be like the heart of the man. That's his core being right here in the heart. In that nucleus, there is, depending on what creature it is, but there is a strand of DNA in there. DNA itself is a complex mechanism. It's very complicated. Even if you have, humans have 46 chromosomes that, that where all their DNA is bundled. But you have simple organisms like one-celled organisms or a, just a, a, some kind of creature with just a few cells in it that have over a hundred chromosomes. In other words, they've got more DNA than we do. What do they need it for? We don't know. But how is it, even if you have all the chemicals and all the minerals that you need in one little pool somewhere on Earth, where they all happen to show up at once, how is it that the first cell just came together forming, number one, a tiny strand of DNA, number two, a, an envelope to put around that DNA to protect it, which is the cell nucleus. Think of an egg. Think of, think of a cell as an egg. The egg has a shell around it, and that's the cell wall. Okay? And then inside the egg, you have the white of the egg, which is basically proteins. It's food for the young chicken to draw from as it develops. You have the yolk of the egg, which is where every now and then you crack an egg and you see this little white thing growing in it. That's a baby chicken. Okay? If you let it go too much more, you'll have a chicken. But anyway, just think of an egg. And how would an egg form all by itself by accident, have the ability to take in nourishment and then have the means to divide itself, split the DNA so that one strand of DNA goes to a new cell or a new egg and another strand of DNA stays in the old cell and now you have two cells that were made out of one. If you can explain that to me in a way that makes sense, I will throw my Bible away and I'll say there is no God. But it's never happened ever. Why isn't it? See, that's the thing. It's not ever been observed, ever, since we had a microscope that had the ability to look at cells and watch them grow and divide. No one, no science lab, no laboratory, no science, no scientist, no university, anywhere in the world has ever seen 
a cell make itself all at once? Because how long does a cell live in your body? Let's say, let's say 30 days. I think that's probably correct. The average cell in your body lives about 30 days. And after that, it dies. So, from the moment this very first cell on the earth magically forms by accident and all the components come together, this cell now has 30 days to figure out on its own how to divide itself so that when the old cell dies, there's copies of it that are still living. I mean, that's how life goes, does, isn't it? I am the product of my father and my mother. My father has now gone on. My mother at some point will pass on. But they have left their genetics behind in the form of me and my sister. So in essence, they still carry on. And I now have produced children. My children have produced children. So far, those children have not produced any children, and I don't want that for a long time now. Okay? But just think about the chances that that would happen all by itself with no help from anything or anybody whatsoever. What are the chances? I don't know the number, but the guy who, um, he, him and uh, another guy won the Nobel Prize for being the first team of scientists to figure out how DNA was put together. Francis Crick and another guy named Watson. And Francis Crick wrote a book about their discovery of DNA. And Francis Crick didn't believe that the first cell on earth formed all by itself. And he put out a number. He did the math of the chances, of the chances that that first cell would form by itself. And it was like 100 billion, kajillion, quintillion, bazillion to one that that cell would make it, okay? It, it would be like if you were in a spaceship flying at 100,000 miles past the earth and you took a dart and threw it out the window of the spaceship as you went by the earth and you landed that dart on a target that you set up on the earth and you hit the bullseye. Okay? The, the number that he came up with, he said, is actually more than the number of atoms in the universe. I don't know how many that is, but that's an astronomical number. The chances that this formed all by itself. And they call us ignorant for believing that we had a creator. They call us ignorant for that. I say they're ignorant for believing this. Amen? Amen. So, just this one cell is an absolute miracle from God. It is the creation of God. God. And you can't mix the two. You can't say, well, I believe God created everything, but he did it over millions and millions and millions of years. Is that what the Bible says? No. The Bible says in the evening and the morning were the first day, in the evening and the morning were the second day, in the evening and the morning were the third day. The Bible just lets you know in no uncertain terms that every day that God, God did the creating it was exactly 24 hours, the same as it is right now. Exactly the same. Okay? Now, we'll get into DNA just a little bit. Okay? Turn to Psalm 139. And is this important? You better believe it is. 
one of the one of the scare things that came out as a result of COVID was that there was a lot of information being passed around on the internet. Some of it was true as far as the things that some scientists are working on. I'll give, I'll give you that. I know for a fact it's true. Uh, I've been reporting on this and teaching on this for, well, 12 years now. And warning people against things that change the human genome. Things that change your DNA. Is it right to change the Bible? It's never right to change God's word. Therefore, God's word exists in us in the form of DNA. And I'll show you that. It's a book that God wrote that makes all of us unique and yet the same. Every human on the planet has a head, a body, two arms, two legs, five fingers, five toes, two nostrils, two ears, two eyes, 32 teeth. Whether you bought them or you grew them, you still have 32 teeth, all right? So anyway, here's what David said. Now remember, they didn't know about DNA. A hundred years ago, they didn't know about DNA. Everything we know about DNA is about 70 years old. Most of what we know about DNA is about 20 years old. And we're learning more and more every day. So here's what David said in Psalm 139. If you look at the verse previous to that, in verse 15, David said, and I love this verse, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. The womb is the secret place. And that's where David was concerned. He was made in a secret place, in secret, and previously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And he said, Thy eyes did see my substance, the things that I'm made of, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, we'll circle the word book, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet... There was none of them. And again, I got that first verse from Chuck Thurston. Uh, we still call each other every now and then. He's, a, he's got a sense of humor like mine. Can you imagine me and him in the same room together? It's a nonstop. We're laughing at each other nonstop. Um, but anyway, he's the one that put me on to this verse. And he said, Mike, that's describing the conception process in DNA. And I went, that is awesome. So now let me break it down what it means. Okay, piece by piece. First of all, in thy book, all my members were written. The members of your body are your fingers, your eyes, your hair, your ugly elbow skin. That's the uncomely part that Paul said was more important than the comely parts. Okay, it doesn't matter how pretty or ugly your face is. Your face doesn't do anything. It's the mouth that takes in the food, right? So it does it take a pretty mouth to eat? No. Does it take a pretty elbow to hold a fork? No. Okay, and you need a lot of skin right there because that's four, forklift. Your toes... Your armpits, the hair in your armpit, the glands that produce the sweat that makes your armpits smell like onions. Never figured that part out, God. Why onions? Why couldn't your armpits smell like roses or something like that? Your lips, those are all members of your body. 
And every one of them, whether you have, Sterling's kind of like me, you have thin lips. Okay? Or Sterling has no lips. Just a slit and that's it. Okay? And my sister has bigger lips than me. Okay? So, in her DNA, her DNA was written in a way that gave her fatter lips. Okay? And then it was up to her mother to make them even fatter every now and then. Like she did me one time in the car. You remember that? It's out here in the parking lot in that Nova. I smarted off to you and you went, WHAP! I didn't do that no more. Yeah, okay. Not to her face. Not to her face. So already this is neat. David is saying this 3,000 years ago. That God wrote a book. And in that book, he wrote the length of my fingers. The color of my skin. How much hair I would grow. How much hair I would lose. My height, my ability to metabolize food. You ever notice some people are just skinny? And it's like they can eat and they're skinny. I can't. I'm stuck at a weight. I haven't lost weight in a week. And I've not changed anything. I'm still doing the same thing as I have been. But for some reason, I'm stuck. I'm not losing any weight this week. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, everything about me is written in that DNA. And it's been there ever since I was conceived. So let's, let's look at it like this. In thy book, DNA, all my members were written. Now we have a, now it's broadened it out. A family. Because my Sons and my daughters are family, what? Members. So, does God see it that way? Yes, because remember what Paul said about Levi. When Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek, Paul said that Levi, being in the loins of Abraham, was also paying tithes to Melchizedek. Even though he wasn't even born or conceived yet. He was still in the loins of Abraham. And yet he paid tithes. So contain, when I was born. From the moment I was born. Every child that I was going to have. Was already in me. In my loins. And they were just waiting for the day for me to get married and for them to be conceived. And they came out exactly the way God intended for them to came, come out. Two of them have sort of brownish, blondish hair. Two of them are red-headed, freckle-faced. And so, let's see, how many red-headed, freckle-faced grandkids do I got? I got Hunter and Elena and Judah. Huh? Yeah, Gwen. So I got four redhead, freckle face grandchildren that inherit it from Courtney and Matthew. But I don't know where the redhead, freckle face come from. Is that on your side? That's Gloria's side. It's your fault. Matthew got teased all the time. But anyway, all the members were written. But all the kids don't come all at once. They are con in continuance fashion. So when Lindsay was born, Lindsay had one look. When Alicia was born, Alicia looked different. Even though for the first year, everybody thought they were twins. And they thought Lindsay was a boy because she never could grow any hair. Okay? Which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. And look, look at this picture here. This is the development of the embryo to a fetus in the human womb. Now, let me ask you this. At what point is this human being alive? At what point? Conception. 
It's already, when a woman says, this is my body, I'll do with it what I want, she's lying. That child has a unique set of DNA. And the DNA does not match the woman's DNA. Now they can trace the mother by looking at the child's DNA, but that child has its own unique set of characteristics. I have yet to see a daughter born who was the twin image of a mother. I have yet to see that. She's always going to be different than her mother. Son's always going to be different than her father. Alicia favors me in her facial features. Lindsay favors her mom. She's got a tiny chin. Courtney, obviously, from the Collier girls. Oh, you call your girls. She's got the Collier redhead freckle face on her. Okay? But all of those were continually fashioned. When as yet, there was none of them. On Here's day one of your life. One cell. But in it contains all the genetic information to eventually make all your fingers, your head, your body, your legs, everything physically, mentally about you is all right there in that one cell. The day after pill will kill this cell. You've just murdered a child. Doesn't matter if it doesn't look like a child. It has the genetic material to make a child. You just killed it. Okay? But then it grows to four cells. And then, let's see, two, four, six. No, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six, and so on. And at first, all of these cells look exactly alike for the first few days. Okay? So, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So that tells us, not only is this book a book of our DNA, it's a book of prophecy. Because it foretells the future. I remember the first time my Uncle Harry down in Arkansas noticed that I had chin hairs. And he looked at me and he said, Oh, I see you got a little razor ass going there, son. Thanks for noticing. Oh, I was so embarrassed. That just showed up one day. Why didn't I have that when I was born? That would be weird. Oh, he's Jojo the dog face boy. Because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet. Years later now, I'm growing hair out of my chin and on my lip. And then I got it under my armpits. And now I'm changing and I hit this growth spurt and I thin out and everything now is different about me than it was two years ago. And that was the DNA kicking in at exactly the right time. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? So if you're praying about something and you're wondering when God's going to do it, don't worry. When it's time, he'll do it. Amen? When Jesus, when God says, Jesus, it's time. Go get my children. It'll be at the exact right time according to the book. Somebody say amen. Father, bless this word. We thank you for it. Lord, teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Remind us, Father, of who we are, where we came from. And Lord, we are like our, like our children. We are still a work in progress. There are things with me, Father, that you have yet to perform. 
There are things in this church that you have yet to perform. So Father, remind us daily, God, that we're not where we want to be. We're not where we ought to be, but we're not where we used to be. And help us, dear God, to have patience and to wait, Father, for the things that you have prepared for us in this life and in the life to come. Teach us these great things, Father, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.